Hey gang, Fraser here with another Counterculture Kickstarter preview video. As always, please remember that the game you're going to see is a pre-production copy, and so the components aren't final. Also, this is a preview. Its intention is just to show you in detail what the game's all about and how it plays. I hope you find it useful and entertaining. Let's get to it. Do you like Euro games? Do you like that heady sort of Euro game that has your mind swimming in a sea of difficult decisions, caught in the currents of many interconnected systems? Do you like games like Terra Mystica, Hansa Teutonica, and the Voyages of Marco Polo? Then Kaid Milifalce, a hundred thousand welcomes to clans of Caledonia. <laughs> There is nothing new under the sun. True novelty is an illusion, it's said, and it's generally achieved by taking echoes of the past, combining them and changing them. Clans of Caledonia proudly flaunts its pedigree, incorporating the most popular elements from some of the most highly regarded Euro games of the last few years. But it combines them in unique and clever ways, making it feel at once very familiar but also undeniably its own beast. If you're with me thus far, then I think you're really going to find this interesting. Let's take a closer look. Clans of Caledonia takes place during the industrialization of Scotland, when Scots started to export their most famous goods, such as whiskey and victory points. You will take control of one of the great clans, such as Clan Mackenzie and others. You'll grab all of your player pieces and populate your player board. This might seem a little bit imposing, but don't worry, it's actually been designed to make playing this monster simpler and quicker. More on that in a moment. Next, we'll pseudo-randomly generate our little corner of Scotland, make ready the all-important market board, and finally prepare the export board where you'll be able to acquire contracts to export your goods and import foreign fancies. There's a lot to consider in Clans of Caledonia, and it's all played out across these four boards. But in essence, you'll be constructing buildings and workers from your player board out onto the main board, taking control of those areas. Now, some of these buildings produce goods and money, while others allow you to refine simple goods into more expensive luxuries. Then you might buy or sell some of those goods at the dynamic market before finally fulfilling an export contract which you'll previously have picked up in order to gain its rewards. But let's start by having a look at that player board. Here we can see all the buildings and workers you have available and unbuilt at the start of the game. If we build a sheep farm we will receive one wool each round. Cows produce milk, dairy farms can convert one milk into cheese, Fields produce two grain, each of which may be refined by bakeries or distilleries into bread and whiskey, respectively. Finally, our lumberjacks and miners can be set to work to generate financial income. Of course, constructing isn't free. Each of these buildings and workers has a different cost, and it will be modified depending on where you build it. Scotland's topography is made up of four different types. Water, grasslands, forests and mountains. Miners can only mine the mountains, lumberjacks can only work in forested regions, and everything else needs to be built on grasslands. However, each hex that you can build on might contain multiple types, which means it offers flexibility as to what can be built there. This hex could contain a miner or a dairy farm, for instance. However, with flexibility comes increased cost. The mountainous region in the foreground here only costs an extra pound to deploy a worker there. Whereas the region to the northwest of it contains grasslands, forests and mountains, but costs an extra six pounds to deploy something to that region. This means there's going to be a land grab for cheaper areas, and you're going to be fighting over territory with your opponents quite quickly. It's also something to consider when you initially pick your first two starting positions at the start of the game, because after that point you can only expand from adjacent hexes. Hmm, I told you there was a lot to think about. One of the really neat things about the player board is that at the end of a round when we determine our income, there's no need to look at the main board. 
just have a look at what's displayed here. Two wool icons are showing and a milk. I already have one grain, so I can use one of my distilleries to turn it into something fun. There's no need for pesky arithmetic with your workers either. Simply look at the lowest open spot and read the income pointed at by your technology tile. It starts pointing at the left hand column at the start of the game, so at the moment my miners are going to give me £18. If I upgrade their technology later, they'll give me 24 So simple, I love it! But that's not the only technology you can upgrade. You can also increase your shipping level, which determines how far across water you're able to expand. The first level lets you cross rivers, so hexes that would normally be considered non-adjacent due to a river separating them can now be expanded to. The next level lets you ignore an entire hex of water, and so on. And that's it! That's the entire player board! Except for these guys. These guys are merchants. You start with two, but you can buy more, and you're probably going to want to. Let me explain why. Ah, welcome to the market, my friends! Now this might not look as impressive as the previous two boards, but here is a mighty cog in the heart of the machine. The current price of each of the goods is depicted with a better token than this prototype one. You can use your merchants to buy or sell at the current price up to the number you send during that action. So I can sell to milk by taking two merchants and putting them in the sale area, like so. When it's my turn again, provided that I still have remaining merchants, I could buy some wool. Now here's where it gets interesting. After you've bought or sold at the current price, it will increase or decrease depending on how many goods you've traded. Meaning that as demand for goods increases, so does the cost and vice versa. Now, at this point in the preview, you probably consider Clans of Caledonia an engine building game. And you're not wrong. You want to build and hone that engine to produce the goods that you're going to be able to then export and convert into victory points. But then the market comes along and offers a whole new dimension of play. Consider this. If whiskey is cheap, why go through the many, many actions and incredible expense of building fields and distilleries when you could just buy a lockful directly? If grain is cheap and whiskey expensive, then buy the grain and distill it yourself. Oh, unless your opponent is sitting on silos of grain herself. In that case, maybe you don't want to increase the going rate for grain? There's a lot to think about here, and ultimately, the market offers some of the key choices in the game. To produce yourself, or to buy. To sell your goods, or to export them. Speaking of which... Here we are at the final board. Let's take a look at these export contracts that I keep talking about. They're pretty simple, really. They show what you have to turn in to fulfil them, and then list their rewards on the right-hand side. You can generally only have one at a time, so making the right choice is important. And when you acquire them, you'll have to pay the current cost that's based on the current round. You actually get paid in the first round, but they become more expensive as the rounds progress. You're going to want to fulfil as many as you can, because there's big points up for grabs if you can fulfil more than your opponents. What's more, some of the rewards offer you immediate bonuses, such as providing a one-time discount to a technology upgrade, which you can activate immediately without taking an action. Most commonly, however, you will receive fancy import goods. Hops are simple and worth 1 VP at the end of the game. It's a little different for the remaining import goods, however. Each time you import cotton, sugarcane or tobacco, you increase a communal track which shows how much of that good has been imported into the country, and will thusly affect the points value of that good at the end of the game. The rarer goods are worth more points, so it's going to pay to be really savvy about what you import, and it'll be worth keeping an eye on what your opponents are up to. The export contracts aren't the only element that should guide your strategy, however. At the start of the game, five round scoring tiles are set out for everyone to see. At the end of each of these rounds, you'll score potentially quite a lot of points for achieving the various conditions. 
This means you can start working on the scoring conditions that will be scored at, say, the end of round four from the very start of the game. You could ignore some, focus on others, or work towards a synergy between them. It's up to you. Smart. Obviously, I don't have time to go into every detail about every element. I have to breeze over the ports, which offer bonuses if you're able to expand into their areas, or the extreme asymmetry of the clans, which offer completely unique mechanisms, such as maturing whiskey, new types of workers, butter production, and so on. I don't have time to discuss the implications of neighbourhood bonuses, which allow you to buy goods more cheaply from the market one time when you expand next to a neighbour's building which produces that good thus saving you money and time since you don't have to use another action to do so, but increasing competition for the surrounding land with your new neighbour. I don't really have time to talk about the variant rules, such as the solo game, but it does have one. One thing I do want to mention, though, is slaughtering. You see, some export contracts require meat, and you can only get that by slaughtering your animals. Returning the piece from the main board to your player board. Now, some of the ramifications of this are quite obvious, right? There might now be a rush from your opponents to fill that hex, particularly if it was one of the cheap ones. But what will really get the steam coming out of your ears is how it affects settlement scoring. Huge points are up for grabs at the end of the game for having lots of settlements connected by shipping routes. A settlement is any group of adjacent components without water between them. So if I have a shipping level of one, I have two connected settlements here, this group and this sheep farm across the river. If I increase my shipping level, I would have three. And if I continued to increase my shipping level, eventually I would have four. So you can see slaughtering animals can benefit you sometimes by splitting up one large settlement into two. Other times it might disconnect a settlement that was previously within shipping range. Ugh. It is a whole other level of strategy that lies on top of the rest of the game, and honestly it just melts my brain. There's just one last note I'd like to make. The game comes with four of these. These, my friends, are player aids. And if your game has more than a page of rules, there's almost no reason for it not to come with one of these. And this is beautiful. The entire rule set of the game is laid out. Look, here is how a round works. Flip over the previous round scoring tile, it won't score again. Put out new export contracts, retrieve your merchants, take your actions, gain income, and score the round. The seven actions you can take are listed and fully explained. And it's worth noting that despite the incredible depth that I've previously described, it's all achieved just through these seven actions. And they're all pretty simple, really. Trade, obtain an export contract, expand, possibly taking your neighbourhood bonus, shipping upgrade, tech upgrade, hire a merchant, fulfil an export contract or pass. That's it. That's all you need to know to play. And it's all here for you on this nice, thick tile. If you are a game designer or publisher, take note. This is how it's done. Whew, sorry, I came over all reviewy there. Let's wrap this preview up. Yes, it's certainly a thinking person's game. Building up your combos, refining your engine, manipulating the market, ensuring you've expanded across the map correctly, taking advantage of your opponent's positions and imports. Whew. If this sounds like something you would like to help produce and get a copy for yourself, then you can check out the Kickstarter page right here. And if you found this video helpful or entertaining, consider checking out some of my reviews and subscribing to the channel. I'm trying to do something a little bit different with board game reviews, and I'd really appreciate your input on whether or not you think it's worthwhile. You can contact me through one of a hundred different channels. But that is all from me for now. So until next time, bye-bye.